Yes, welcome everyone um, to the first informative event of uh, ESP. It's a new service that has taken me about 18 months to build. Uh, it's a website and it's tailored basically to help people um, dealing with properties online, making it a lot easier both for vendor and for purchaser. Um, so we will have three of these informative events and we conduct them to basically make people to understand better real estate because I think for people to use this service is much better to understand about property, to understand the lease title, all the documents that go for the sale and purchase of property so then it is easier to do it online. Now this service doesn't replace the real estate agent, otherwise I would put myself out of work. And in fact, it's ancillary to waterfront real estate. At the moment, it's exclusive to waterfront real estate. And um, it just helps to make all the paperwork easier and faster. And it is a process that will help buyer and seller in doing everything they need to do collect the information and then proceed in what they need to do. But it doesn't transfer the property. So you still need the real estate agent to be able to make the deal, which is what we do best between two parties, and you still need legal advice for the conveyance and also for making sure that the contracts that you sign are good for you, so to get legal advice. I'm trying to launch the future of real estate online. As we know, the digital technology is advancing, so one day eventually when everything will transfer to the uh, digital world, we will be ready in Vanuatu with that. A little bit about myself, so you do know who I am. I've been here since 2008. Um, I have a Bachelor in Law. I have been doing real estate all my life pretty much in Vanuatu since 2008 with waterfront real estate. I have designed and project management in many, many buildings, so that's another thing that I add to my expertise. I've been member of the Council of the uh, Chamber of Commerce. I am member of the financial association that I represent on the board of FIFA. And here we have Manager Raymond from the FIFA. Thank you for coming. So what we're doing today, of course, welcome uh, and opening. We'll explain the list title for both lessors and lessees. Um, we we'll look at all the property documents necessary for transactions, so you'll understand how it works. It's pretty simple, really, but for people that are not used to that, it, it, it could be quite daunting and worrisome. We look at the role of the real estate agent in the transaction, and then we'll explain <coughs> the ESP and how it works. Now, let's start with the lease title explain. Now, I'm not sure if um, any one of you have seen a lease title before, but it looks pretty much like that. That's the first part. Obviously, I had to cut pieces to make sure that you can see them well in the screen. So, the lease title is provided by in the Land Leases Act, um, which is part of the law of Vanuatu. There are many other acts in Vanuatu that are pertaining to the property law, but today we just look simply at the lease. So there are elements on the lease. You have, first of all, the class. So you will see in this case, you've got a rural res residential lease. The class basically explains to you what the land is going to be used for. So it can be residential, it can be commercial, it can be commercial tourism, it can be industrial, agricultural. So that's the first thing that you need to know when you start a lease or when you purchase the lease, that you purchase the lease that you want to have for the use you want to use it for. Then we've got the title number, which is a unique number that identifies, excuse me, identifies the property, you, the property uniquely. Normally the first number um, tells you the location, so 12 is for rural Ephate. Um, in town for Villa is 11, and then you have other islands that have got 4, 3, etc. Sato is 4. And then you have the lessor and the lessee. Now, the lease is a contract. 
So for us lawyers, uh, it's very easy to say contract, but perhaps not everyone understands. A contract is basically a binding agreement between parties. There can be multiple parties, in this case, in this case we've got two. And the contract describes basically the obligation of each party. So in the lease, we have the obligation of the lessor and the lessee. The lessor is the traditional council owner of the land, and the lessee is the person that purchases the land in the form of a leasehold, normally for 75 years in rural areas, in town sometimes for 50 years. Um, the reason why we have this kind of, is called tenure, the way you hold the property is called tenure, so it's the type of tenure that we have in Vanuatu generally is leasehold, as opposed to freehold that we have in other countries like Australia, New Zealand, Italy, etc. I believe the reason why is to make sure that the indigenous people are protected and that their right to own their land is protected, that not everyone comes in here, buys everything, and then they'll be completely out of their land. In this way, they keep the ownership of the land and they can only lease it for 75 years. Obviously, there, there are some leases that do have the option to renew, and also, it can be renewed by different negotiation at the end of the term. But generally speaking, this is what the Constitution of Vanuatu provides. So me, for example, when I came in here, I couldn't buy land and become a lessor, and I never can be, even though I'm a citizen, because I'm not a natural citizen of Vanuatu. So lessor, lessee, and the next thing that you have normally is the premium. The premium is the price you pay to buy the lease. And the reason here is not there is because a lot of leases are a result of subdivisions. So when you do the first lease, you've got the premium there. So say you buy a big block of land for like 50 million, and then the developer divided in, in different lots. So when the lots get registered, the premium gets crossed off because that lease doesn't have part of the premium. Now, you went on before and now you don't want to go on. Yeah. Then we have the term of the lease. So as I say, 75 years and it tells you when it starts. In this case, it was November 2006. Then we have the provision for the land rent. So every year the lessee has to pay to the lessor a land rent. In this case, the amount of 30,000 baht. And it tells you when you have to pay, in this case, on the 1st of November every year in advance. Then there's another um, provision that you also find in the transfer of lease that says how the lease is held. So in the case of joint individual, for example, like if you have a husband and wife, you can have joint proprietor or proprietor in common. Proprietor in common is normally people that are not married. So the, the right goes to the descendant of one party, where when you have husband and wife, normally when one passes away, the property joins to the other party. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, the shadow is normally blank and it gets crossed, uh, unless there is something special that the party wanna say. Sometimes you must check, you might have the, the is the live still going? Yeah, very good. The land rent expressed by square meter. So you could have in here, for example, like 50 baht per square meter. And it's something I've seen in leases, but generally it's crossed off. And then we have the shadow. So the lease basically is like in an A3 form. So you've got four pages that are always the same. You've got the first page that we just described. Got the same people that they should call me now. Obligation <laughs> between the lease, the lessor and the lessee. So you got the payment of the rent, review of the rent, and it should go up like kind of CPI, you know, like what what is the normal increase of prices. Um, and then we've got the agreement by the lessee. So the lessee, for example, has to use in this case the, the land only for private residential dwelling. Um, they have to properly pay rent. There's all sorts of things, you know, like you can use sand and gravel or you can't or some kind of thing. So this basically is what the lessee can do 
Um, one important thing is that without the consent of the lessor, this falls to the lease. So that's what, as you probably know, we need the consent of transfer from the lessor. So the lease is a contract. So if I have a contract with you, obviously I have it because I trust you and I want to enter in a lease with you. But if you go and sell it to someone else, I don't know that someone else, I don't want to be involved with it unless I give my consent. So that's a normal standard thing that when you sell your position in a contract, you have to ask the consent of the other party. So that's why the lessor needs to sign the consent of transfer, which we'll see after. And another thing, for example, also to subdivide or strike a title or all these things, you need the consent of the lessor. I won't go in detail of all the little provision, but I just outlined the most important one. Um, the customer owner has to guarantee that they are the legitimate customer owner of the land to the lessee, because normally to find out who is the customer owner, you have to go to land department and go through the green certificate, etc., etc., before you can actually buy the lease. But that's a guarantee that the lessor gives to the lessee, I am the customer owner. Then you've got the agreement by the lessor. One of the most important things that the lessor must do is to leave the lessee in peace. So you have to have the peaceful, quiet, enjoyable enjoyment of the land. Do we just get that top clause there? So one yes. I'm more interested in. Yes, well... So that's the expiry of the lease. I know this is contentious, but can you explain what actually does happen? I do, I do. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to dwell on this because it <laughs> is a contentious. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, well, put it this way, a lease is a contract, and unfortunately I had the impression that a lot of the legislation was actually grabbed by legislation that governed the range of places. So somehow the the provisions are a little bit yeah, confusing. Yeah, the legislation hasn't been passed. Yeah, the, mean, at the moment, the way it is, is the way that it's written in the list. So, so you have to look at your list, your own list. There are different, different types um, where at the determination of the list, so this is an obligation by the lessee. Yeah. Peacefully and quietly deliver back and possession of the demised land, including all improvement thereon, to the lessor. In this case, it says to be paid at market price to the lessee, failing which the lessee might be entitled to lease the premise for a further period to be agreed. So, so once the lease expired, then this one was 75 years less, I think it was from two. 2006, wasn't it? But this one was 2006, yeah. So, 2000, that's... Whenever it expires, yeah. That's 18 years less from 75, so we're looking at, say, 60, 57 of this now. So, after 57 years, um, I know you get reviewed every five years, after 57 years in this example, you they take the land in, and get paid market price of the improvements or what's there, usually a house set, a residential house. So that, uh, who determines the market price? An independent value? Well, that's, that's yeah. The, you see, when I study law, <laughs> uh, one well, of Why the I'm asking is, can you include these clauses? Rather than using, I mean, use the standard form. You can, you can. But can you include these as part of the negotiation? In the in the standard format of the lease, it says you peacefully walk away and and leave the property. Yeah, but you get the now, what, market price, market value. What we have to go, you see. It's, the interpretation of these things is always a bit complicated. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. law was simple, then <laughs> there, there, wouldn't, there wouldn't be court cases going on forever. Yeah. So let me explain. Um, well, what normally happens, for example? Well, we don't know start. yet. We don't know yet because we haven't had, we haven't had yet an expiration <coughs> of a rural lease 
that, that say that. We had expiration of leases in town, and in town what happened is that we, the legislation now provides for the lessee to ask for an extension. So now if you're a lessee in one of the leases in town, you right. go to the land department because the leases in town are under the minister. At what stage do you ask for that extension? You can do any time, yeah. but you cannot extend the lease more than the term of the lease. Yeah. So say for example that the lease is 50 years yeah. and, and you have 25. 20 years left. Yeah. Okay? So you can only extend for another 30 years. Wrong. So the, the total term of the lease cannot be more than the term of the lease. The one that we saw before in page one. So a lot of people argue that because in town the legislature have already expressed the will to make to give the lessee the right to extend the lease yeah. and the valuation is done by the valuation unit of the land department. Yeah. So I guess in the rural, in the private, private um, situation that will probably be of course up to the parties to decide what value they agree upon so perhaps each one of them want to get a valuation sometime in the lease is provided it like it's like 10 percent of the unimproved value of the land etc so a lot of people like developers lawyers um, real estate agents argue that because the lawyer, the, the legislature has already provided for that for the leases in town, that the same principle should apply for the leases in rural area. However, it is not for certain. We haven't had a case and we haven't had court cases on to that to actually decide what it is. My best, um, my best approach to these things as someone who has um, always approached the law as fair rules, I would say that when you purchase a land and you put a lot of improvement on the land, most of the time the value of the improvement is even more than the value of the land, yeah. it will probably be unfair for the custom owner to benefit <coughs> of that value uh, just outright. However, it is not certain. It is something that is left to the party to decide. Good. The best advice that I could give is always to try to have the best relationship between the parties so that then you can actually understand each other, you can fulfill the obligation of the lease, make sure that everyone <coughs> is happy, so that then you can find a peaceful way to, to no, either I, continue or terminate. I mean, all of it should be a clause, isn't it, initially? Which gives you the option to extend or to extend. I mean, both parties the option. So at least it gets raised in the initial. But period. that's but that's an important part of when you purchase a lease outright, like when there is no title on the land yet. So that's something that the party should actually look into that, and then that will have to go be approved by state law, be signed by the minister, and then register. So I did something like that in my leases when I registered leases in development that was approved by state law and, and, and it was signed by the minister. So that that is something. Now I might have to go on and we might leave the question. You have your, your pad there, so if you have another question you can just note it and we can discuss it all at the end. So then we we try to stay in the time frame and complete this as soon as possible. But yes, this is a very important topic and I believe that the legislature and the people should should address it at some stage and make sure that there is certainty on the holding of properties because that also will incentive investment in the country. Yeah. So it is important that but it is up to the legislature to decide well, thinking what as, to build. Well, thinking as it from an investment incentives perspective. And we we do too. <laughs> it is important that, that people have certainty of their rights on the land. Um, but I also don't stress it enough that it's important for people to have good relationship with their customers 
Um, it's a contract. It's a long-term contract. It's 75 years. So and I think it's one of the best aspects of Barwa to actually to have interaction between the people that invest and improve land and people that own the land. Now, going um, further, uh, re-entry provision, for example, when the lessee doesn't do the things that are provided by the lease, so when there is a breach of the condition of the lease by the lessee, so that the occupier, the purchaser of, of the land, the thing, I'll give you another year, but you have to at least start or something. Then if nothing happens, then re-entry provision is actually proceeded to forfeit the lease and the lessor can get its land back. Determination of dispute, yeah, um, like a land referee, if there is a dispute, there's a, a, a provision try to have mediation rather than going straight to court. And the governing law, which is normally the law of Vanuatu for us, the um, English law with exclusion, exclusion of the French, but if you're French, you can use the French law as well. That's a beautiful thing about Vanuatu. We've got English law, French law, and speaking different languages. Now, one of the most interesting and important part of the lease is obviously the survey plan. Now, certificate of negotiation. So, anyone who wants to go and buy land from a custom owner first has to identify the custom owner, which is quite a a long process. <coughs> Second, has to obtain a certificate of negotiation to be able to enter a lease with the custom owner. So once you have that, then you can um, go and survey the land. So you do your survey, you present it to the land department, the land department, the property. When you look at this, you see if you have the title number, you have the area of the lease. So if you want to know the square meter and all this acre and acre, Hectares and acre complicate your life. Just get all the number, and it will give you the number of square meter. So in this case, for example, it's four five four five, so it's four thousand five hundred and forty five square meter. And these little round dots are normally where you find the pegs on the land. Not all of them. Normally, you don't get them in the. This is the mean high water mark. So it's basically the high tide mark on the waterfront and, and the, normally the pegs are about 20 meter behind. Now, I don't know if you saw, if you had the opportunity to see, but where I am and I'm on and I'm on the beach and I have a lot of grass, the wave and the spray of the cyclone came up to the 80 meters. So I would strongly suggest never to build further in front, then to at least 20 meters. And in the new uh, subdivision um, direction that have been approved in 2019 guidelines, you will have actually a buffer zone of 15 meters where you can't build. Five years later, 
So that's... 2013, eh? Yeah, that's <laughs> why. Now, this is when the minister actually signed the lease. So when, when, you, when you sign a lease <coughs> with the parties, then you have... I wonder if these people are here for the... For the or for something else? Because they are able to come in if someone... So when you enter a lease and you sign the lease, then the process is that the lease has to go to state law. State law check the lease, approve the lease, and then it goes to the minister to be signed. And then after that, it goes back to you, and then you can present it to the FSC for stamping and to registration for registering. And then it's a registered lease. When the lease is registered, underneath the signature on the page, you'll have the certificate of registration. I need to move my car. Can you, <laughs> do you know how to do it? You just press. Do you know how to turn it on? Yeah, yeah. good. There is no key. Just <laughs> press the brake. Yeah. So this basically tells you that the lease was registered in 2014. So even from the signature to the registration, the already proprietor. Um, it's just the process of lodging to the FSC and well, registration. In this example, that's. Um, Eight years from. Is it well, I, I'm not sure what was behind there between the, the initial term and when they signed the lease. Well, I'm not sure the reason for that. What's common? What's, what's normal? What's common? Uh, I wish I could tell you. <laughs> it depends. You can have something done pretty fast or some taking a long time. It depends. At the moment, it's a little bit difficult because the reform of 2014 actually brought in a lot of procedures that need to be done. However, um, my best advice is to go to people that know what they're doing. <laughs> so it's easier to go through all the procedure in a faster way. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, one of the good things about Vanuatu is that you can do pretty much everything. One of the not so good things is that as a developing country, we still has a bit of time in going through this. Let's say the original site was 212. Yeah, and that's when was, the lease was signed, so and that's when the lease years. is registered. But per, perhaps because the minister signed in 2013, you see, the, yeah. obviously the lease was lodged after the, the signature. Then VFSC takes probably two, three weeks. Then you send it to registration. <coughs> registration <coughs> takes a lot of time. We had time, for example, Cycle of Town, where all the files uh, got were entered, and they had to put everything in, 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 um, in digital form. So, yeah, sometimes it might take a bit of time. But I have seen from experience that perseverance and good relationship always bring you the result, uh, especially good relationship with the people you enter in the lease with, because then they are with you, they want you to get everything done so you can start the development. Now, let's go into other property documents. Then if you have some more questions, I'm happy to, to respond at the end. Um, this is a very important document. This is the document that gives you the ownership of, the proof of ownership of your lease. And it's called Advice of Registration of Dealings. We call it Advice of Registration. So basically this one, which was mine, you have the lease number. It tells you it's a rural residential lease, the date of the lease, the date the lease was registered, and then you have the name of the lessor, the name of the lessee, the, the term, the premium, the rent, and this is very detailed actually, they put everything, sometimes you don't have this, you only have the name of the lessor and the lessee. But when your name is written in there, you know that you are the registered lessee owner of the property. So for the ESP, for example, the portal, 
it is important that the person or the company or the trust that owns the property register on the ESP because the ESP is designed in a way that every contract to be valid has to be made by the person who is owner of the land or the company or the trust. So in this case, for example, this is an individual, one single individual, myself. You have other example, this uh, different advisors of registration. So you've got a joint individual, like husband and wife. So if they want to register to ESP, they both have to register. So they'll choose joint individual registration. In this case, you have a company as an owner of the property. And you see here is a transfer of lease. In the one before, and there's a transfer of lease, and there's a transfer of lease. Most of the time, you become the owner of the property through a purchase, a transfer from a previous owner, either the developer or someone else. In that case before, it was just me as rural resident because I registered the lease first. Okay, so normally this happens for developers. But if you go and purchase a property, you will become the owner when they register the transfer of the lease to you. So you can be joint individual, company, or a trust. A trust also can, a trustee, as the trustee of the trust can also be a registered lessee. So it is important for the ESP that you choose the right, the right registration because the question are different. We have been through the the lease, the um, survey plan. Another important document is the land rent receipt for your last land rent pay. Obviously, you have to make sure you pay land rent regularly every year, as it is detailed in the first page of the lease. Remember, and and you need this because a settlement. Say that the lease is due in November and you settle in March, then the vendor might have paid the lease for the whole year and so the purchaser has to give back the portion from March to November because then they become the owner from March to November so they have to pay. So this is adjustment of prices that you do at settlement. Another document that you might have um, is covenants or restrictive agreements. They normally pertain to a, an estate, um, like this one is three coal for example, and you have common area, you have rules for the estate, so there are special covenants that the party agreed to, like not to build certain type of building, not to build close to this or close to that, not to go to stories, make sure that you know, the common area doesn't have um, rubbish and stuff like that. So they can be registered at the land department. So when they are registered at the land department, you have to be aware that they are there because they rule the way you can use the property. All those documents can be uploaded on the ESP. And, and a lot more. You can upload evaluation, you can upload your contract when you purchase, you can upload the transfer of lease when you purchase the land. But only certain documents are visible to the buyer for confidentiality reasons. So someone who wants to buy a property and register to ESP, they can see a beautiful property on the waterfront real estate and they say, oh, I would like to buy this property. So then they can identify the documents if they register to the ESP, they can straight away go and have a look at the lease title and the survey plan. And if there is any covenant or restrictive agreement, they can have a look at it. But other documents, <coughs> they can't have a look at um, So that basically covers the most important documents that regard a property. And the advantage of the ESP, if you register as an owner and want to sell a property, is that you'll have a database of your documents there online. You can access them anywhere, whenever you want to. If you need to give them to someone that wants to buy a property or to your lawyer, or if you need to check something, you just one click of a 
of a login and then you have all your property documents there. Now, they're real estate agents. Now, real estate agents, you know, like people always say, oh, don't trust real estate agents, lawyers, and all that. And I'm going, okay, well, I have a bit of all of them, so no one should trust me. It's not true. It is not true. I really love what I'm doing because a good real estate agent is someone that really wants the party to be happy. It, it works for the vendor, and it wants the vendor to sell the property and be satisfied, and the buyer to buy the property be satisfied so that's the main thing and the reason why you have an agent is because putting two parties that they don't know each other to agree and make a deal especially if they're not trades people they're used to make deals all the time on property it can be quite difficult so most of the time people that try directly might actually have a failure in trying to reach a deal where the help of the real estate is very important on that case a real estate agent is defined as a licensed professional who represents the vendor in a real estate transaction. This is this, the general case. There are also agencies that represent buyer, but most of the time in, in Vanuatu is representing the vendor. And they get paid by commission on the sale price. So the normal commission for an agent in Vanuatu is 5%. So what you have to put into account is if you want to sell your property, the price you get, 5% goes to the um, agent. You can negotiate or you can register on ESB and we'll give you a special offer. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the owner of a property who wants to sell is called vendor and the person who wants to buy a property is called purchaser. That is in normal life and it is especially on the ESP. So you need to understand that when you go and register. The vendor needs to appoint the real estate agent. So there needs to be an agreement between the vendor, the owner of the property and the agent. Where the vendor say, yes, you can go and market my property. Yes, I agree to pay you the commission when you sell it. So that is all in an agreement, in a contract. It's called appointment of real estate agent. The agreement gives the agent the authority to market the property on behalf of the vendor and the right to get paid the commission. So what happened in the ESP is that we can do that online. And it's much easier than 300,000 emails. This is what an appointment of real estate agent looks like. So you have detail of the client, detail of the agent, detail of the property, the type of appointment, because you can have an agent, an open listing, exclusive listing, exclusive means I'm the only agent, open means there are other agents that can sell the property. Um, the term of the agency, you can say, okay, well you try to sell my property for three months, for six months, for 12 months, until it's sold. Um, then the in our in our appointments we also provide a detailed property description details so that we know everything about the property to tell a potential buyer and there is a form that people just have to tick things and so they guarantee that those information are true and they also accept the standard provision which is the fine, fine print of the contract which in ESP you can download and, and read at your pace and then before you sign anything. The commission, um, if we can put a sign on the property, detail of the solicitor and then the signature and the date of course because that determines where the terms of the agency starts. When um, the reason why all those documents are important is because the client has to be the registered lessee, remember? Either the individual, the joint individual, the company or the trust that is registered or lend department as the registered lessee. And we need the lease, the copy of the lease and the survey plan to be able to put the correct details of the property. There is another painful thing, <laughs> legislation which is the AML and CTF, is the Anti-Money Laundering and Counter-Terrorism Finance. 
So real estate agent, banks, lawyers, and a bunch of other people that collect normally a lot of uh, money from people are uh, called registered entity under this act. And so we are compelled by law to collect information from anyone that deals with us. So we need personal information, we need IDs, we need information about the beneficial ownership, like if you're not the owner, if you're the trustee, or etc. Where did you get the source of fund for the property or the property you want to buy? Was it through business? Was it a, a gift or something? Uh, because every transaction over a million baht, we need to provide those details to the bank when we receive the money, otherwise they don't clear it. And we need to provide it to the financial intelligence unit when the transaction goes to our account. So we have a trust account. Normally people give us the deposit for the property and they give us some time also the balance that then we have to transfer to the vendor. So we are subject to all these. So one of the things that the ESP does is that through the registration, we collect all the information and the ID immediately. So when the time comes that you need to get the money, the money gets cleared to your account very quickly. And trust me, it is important, because it can take days and days and days if you have to go and collect all the information, otherwise the bank won't clear it. Um, so that was for the vendor, and the vendor signed the appointment of real estate agency. For a buyer, <coughs> when a buyer wants to buy a property, obviously they have to put an offer in. Now, we, as professional real estate, we don't accept verbal offer because, as they say in Latin, verba volant, you, you know, flies away. So you can come to me and say, oh yeah, I want to buy that property, or oh, this is my offer, tell the vendor and tell him if he's accepted. And I'm going, uh -uh. you need to sign something because otherwise you can come to me just because you want to see if what the vendor is going to say just for your sake and then disappear. So normally you sign a contract for sale and purchase as your offer. The contract can be either our agency form or it can be a contract provided by the solicitor of the buyer. Sometimes the solicitor of the vendor is not the contract because it might be a development. So the, the, the developer already has all the standard contract for selling the properties. And basically what you have in the contract, you have the detail of the vendor, the detail of the buyer, the lawyers, detail of the property, you identify the property, you identify if there's any encumbrances like um, uh, easements or, or mortgages or something that you want to know to make sure that a settlement of mortgages are, are cleared. The purchase price, the deposit, the deposit is normally 10% of the purchase price and normally it gets transferred to the trust account of the real estate agent or the lawyer of the um, vendor and that deposit then gets detracted uh, from the balance of the purchase price when you go a settlement. You have other clauses, you might have finance, you might want to ask for finance and then have 30, 60 or 90 days to say oh, I need to go to the bank and ask approval for finance. So this is our agency contract and then you might have some special condition. One of the conditions that we always have in the contract is to obtain the consent of transfer. I explained to you before that you cannot transfer a lease unless the lessor gives the consent. There's a special form that the lessor must sign and then and then that together with the transfer of lease gets lodged for registration. So then the purchaser signs witness and give it to the agent and then the agent goes to the vendor and say, and that's what we do best. Trying to make sure that we reach a deal, that both parties are happy. Now, what I went into the ESP is that both the appointment of the real estate agent and the contract, you can do it straight online. Because once you have completed all the information that we need, those forms get completed immediately. You only have to add a few things like for example the price you want to offer or if you have some special conditions that, like pest inspection or you want to have evaluation or something like that. And then 
they get automatically signed online. You can download them before you sign, you go to your lawyer, you show them. When you're happy, you come back to the website and you can sign it. So that's the easy thing to do. When the agent is a very good agent and does what it does best, then the vendor will also sign the agreement and then the contract is finished and the property is under contract. After the contract, what happens is that we need to fulfill the condition. So you need to have best inspection, due diligence, whatever condition you have in there. You need to obtain the consent of transfer signed by the lessor. You need to prepare the settlement statement. So if there is any, for, you know, different in the land rent, etc., etc. So you say to the buyer, okay, you need to pay that balance as settlement. To the vendor, you will get this money as settlement, and then proceed for a final property inspection to make sure that the property is still there or has been cleaned or whatever. If, it, if it's a house, especially, you do a, a final inspection, and then you proceed to settlement. A settlement. Normally, there is an exchange of document for money, which we will we'll see. It's only a settlement that then the property is sold. I sometimes hear this funny thing, you know, people go under contract, so the contract is signed by the parties, and then they say, oh, I sold my property. And I go, oh, okay, did you settle? Did you get the money? I don't know, but I sold it. It's still horses, because anything can happen between signing the contract and actually selling the property. And that's where it's very important to have good professionals looking after you. This is a transfer of lease. This is the document that transfers the lease from a party to another. It's a form also provided by the Land Leases Act. So you've got the transfer of, which is normally the registered lessee of the property. You've got the transferee, which will be the registered lessee of the property. And then you have the amount of money that I've paid, which is needed by the government to charge their fees, which we will see what it is. And these conditions normally are, are always crossed off unless they are relevant. There's also the way you hold the property if you're, if you're a double individual or as a joint um, common proprietor, common or joint proprietor. Then you have the schedule again, which I told you that is normally crossed off. The signature page, I explained to you before, if it's a company, you only need the company seal. If it's a person, then you have um, the witnessing, uh, the standard notes. So a settlement, basically, you have the exchange. This is a consent of transfer. So in this case, the, the consent was given by a minister. Sorry. The Minister of Land, let's see, of the property gives the consent um, to transfer the property from the transferor to the transferee for that value that was indicated in the transfer of lease. So this document can sign together with the transfer of lease. The vendor has to deliver the signed transfer and the consent to the purchaser. The purchaser delivers the balance of the purchase price and the agent normally retains the commission from the deposit held in trust and gives the rest to the vendor. Um, after this, the buyer has the document signed. So all those documents, normally is their solicitor that will lodge into the VNBC for stamp duty and pay 2% of the purchase price as a government fee. And then that takes about two, three weeks and then once they're given back, and I'll show you the form stamped, then it goes for registration at the land department where you lodge it and you pay 5% of the purchase price. So if you buy a property, remember, you have to pay 7% of cost to the government. This is the same transfer of lease. It's been stamped by a by VFSC and has been registered. That's the certificate of registration. So once you have this, you know that you're the owner of the property. Okay, so that was probably something that you already know very well, so you didn't need to take part of that. 
Um, unfortunately, I think the cyclone didn't help our audience today. <laughs> but the most interesting part now is the ESP portal. Now, before we do that, um, do you have any questions? Just to relax a bit. Well, what I prefer to do is email please. The events in most of them are at certain cloud applications that I just want to get. Basically, you know, what's more common, what's normal, what happens in certain situations. Well, that that is quite but complicated. I mean, you could write a book on those things. If you do have some specific, some specific, just just write the notes, and then you can send me an email. And that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Some specific, or if you have the time, like, a little bit later, we can respond here so everyone can can hear it. Um, now, let's then start with this. I had this lighting Vislama because I thought if if the audience was mainly Vislama, then it was easier to understand. Um, as I said to you before, the ESP is. It's not that complicated, actually. It's very simple. It was complicated to build. <laughs> it was really complicated to build. Um, 18 months. But it's basically aimed at making sure that all that we've seen before can be done online and can be done safely. Um, the agent is still there to actually help with the transaction because that's what we need to do. And the lawyer is still there to check all the documents because every document can be downloaded in PDF and brought to your lawyer before you come and sign. But basically it's aimed at avoiding 100,000 emails, avoiding you to go to the real estate office two or three times or something, making sure that you can collect all your property documents and have them stored in a, in a safe place online. And so basically stream, streamlining the process. And as I like to say, with an ESP block pen, more silent ground, in a normal stressful, taking up time, more complicated. So let's see how it works. Basically, you have some step to follow, and, and then the subscription is completed. One is completed, if you're a vendor, you can receive offer online and you have all your documents in there. If you're a buyer, you can see the documents and you can put offers online. So to get started, this is our webpage, the ESP enablesubspecific.com. You go in there, you click get started. You can watch this plenary video. There is one in English and one in Islam, so it's easy for everyone. And then you get into a dashboard like this and you basically register here. So you click on that, that's before you already have your login details. It explains you here that if you're a vendor, you must be the register lessee. Remember what we explained before on the advice of registration? If you're a purchaser, you must be the one that you want to be the register lessee of the property. Um, once you have entered your name, email address, and username and password, you receive an email, you go back in there, and then you log in. And then your process starts. You decide if you are a vendor or a purchaser, so you select that, one of the two. Okay, and then as I said, you can choose if you're an individual, a joint individual, a company, or a trust. Depends on who is the register receipt, because the, the, the questions are different. And then you start. This is an example of the individual profile. So everything you do has got clear step. Say for an individual, for example, first of all, your first step is to put personal details. Um, business, occupation, and upload your photo ID. So for an individual, joint individual, both of them, you just put your personal detail, occupation, and upload that personal ID. 
easy. We need the residential address and a few questions that we need for the FIU. Remember that I explained to you before, we need to do those declarations, so we need to, we collect them first. And then you have some things you have to take, you know, that the information are true and correct, and that you authorize us to disclose to the authority provided by the AML and CTF, and then you submit. And basically after that, your first step of subscription is done. That's not difficult. You can do it at home on your computer, da, 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 that's it. But then I already have everything I need to send you money fast when you want to sell a property. Um, then step two. Step two then is detail of the property. So say that you are a vendor, for example, you will have to put, you know, title number, class, etc. All those things that you can get from the lease. If you're a purchaser, you will say, I look for an agricultural property, I wanna I I have these patches between this and that. If you're a vendor, you put all your detail how much you want to sell the property for and all that. And then you upload the document. Now some document, where it's not, you're running too fast. Some documents are compulsory, so you can't proceed unless you upload them. If you don't have them, you can click here, you go to our website and there is a way you can order the document, you pay a fee and we can collect all the documents for you. If you're not sure about what documents you have, just send it to us or upload, whatever, and then I'll organize them all and I'll put them up correctly <coughs> for you. Me or the staff. Then you have a summary, in all your form you have a summary that you can see all your information and check everything is correct. And then again you go to click the boxes and then submit. So that's it. You have basically subscribed to SP, either as a vendor or a purchaser. What happens is then, then, then the subscription comes to us and we check it and once we so you complete the step one, personal detail. Step two, property detail. Step three, we approve you. And once we approve you, you're subscribed. And then, if you are a vendor, you can go ahead and sign the appointment of real estate agent, which will be ready, because all the information are already there. All you have to add is a couple of things. And then you can sign it online, or you can download it, bring it to the lawyer, come back, and sign it online. Um, if you're a buyer, what you can do is access the property documents. So you can access up to five properties, their leases, their survey plan. Um, they come up like this. And the way, remember, the buyer cannot see all the documents. They can only see what they could see at the land department if they go there. Um, in our website, there's a listing ID. There you've got the listing ID on the ESP. So if you're a buyer and you're registered to ESP, you just click get access on the property that you want and you can see the property documents. And then you can make an offer online. So this is mainly aimed at simple transactions. Like if you had, that's why I think it's great for Nima Moato and local people, because it'll make it a lot easier to do transactions in property. Especially because you don't have to be scared to go to an agent or, or lawyer or something. I mean, you, you, I always advise to go and get legal advice, but at the same time, you can start with this and you can just upload your information and then to sign the documents, all you have to do is to upload a sample of your signature and then you just scrabble with your mouse in there and it, and it is signed. And then the copy of the document, which we normally would do through emails, 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 you just do simply online, which is a lot easier. And I think for simple transaction, it's a very, very simple system. Obviously, if you have complicated big property where there's a lot of issues, big values, um, uh, leases, subleases, uh, co commercial business, <coughs> then, then it's different. You will receive an email with your contract attached to it, both for the appointment of real estate agent and the contract. So if you are a, a, a vendor, you have successfully listed your property for sale with Forefront Real Estate. If you are a buyer, 
you have access to documents and you can easily put a contract through, which is binding if you want to. Um, as I said, this does not eliminate the agent and does not eliminate the lawyer. It just makes all the paperwork and all the things a lot easier and faster. But then as a buyer, you want to, and as, an a, as a vendor, you want to have an agent that helps you to close the deal and make the deal that makes you happy. So that's, that's why um, if you're a vendor, you will have been the agent going market the property. So we'll have our website, the real estate, waterfront real estate, and market the property. If you are a buyer, um, you still, after the contract, uh, have to proceed in all the, all the condition of the contract to be met, and then there is settlement done by the lawyer with the proper transfer of leads, etc. This is some testimonial. We already had a couple of contracts online and quite a few people have registered. So the main feedback that we get is that it's easy and that it can also be done from overseas. Um, if you're overseas and you want to buy property in Vanuatu, it's a lot easier to register to uh, ESP. The main thing I think is going to be, and I've had a lot of registration between the advertisement and now, is for local people to actually register to sell their property. Just a, 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 a summary, so first you register with your name and address, then you complete your personal profile, either as a vendor or buyer, remember you must be the registered C or representative of, of the entity. Then the property detail that you want to sell or you want to buy. Um, the completion of the agency appointment if you're a vendor and then access to the documents and contract if you are a buyer. All the documents can be downloaded and shown to a lawyer before you sign. So the only recommendation I can give is that before you start the subscription to have all your document ready. So make sure you have your ID ready, personal document, if it's a company, a registration certificate, an extract of the company we need, uh, if it's a trust, a trust deed to upload. Those documents are confidential, they're not going to be shown to anyone apart from the bank and the FIU if needed. Uh, property document, the compulsory one, list title, survey plan, which is part of the list title, but it's good to have a separate for clarity per buyer. And it goes too fast. And the receipt of the land rent, which will help us making the calculation as settlement. If you miss some of the documents, just go on our website and we can collect them for you. Now, these are the main advantage of the ESP. It basically takes you 25 to 30 minutes to register. Um, it's a straightforward process, as you see. You've got all your steps, the summary, you can check, you can do, you can download, you can come back, you can stop, you can save and come back. So you can do it at your own pace. Um, save new time of uh, all the emails with the agent and this and that and, and come to the office, etc. Very fast, this one. Um, save your costs because you don't have to go run up and down all the time. Um, you sort out all your property documents when you have them in a, in a secure database, and then um, you can do all your agreements online, download them, etc. And it's free. But at this stage, it's only exclusive to waterfront real estate. So, you might have to put up with me. <laughs> so to start, you just go to the website and that's, and that's easy. So it seems easy, but there are a lot of details that have been put in there in the way that we ask questions. Uh, there is a lot of issue to do with confidentiality, a lot of issue to do with the way that you structure the form and how the form gets completed. So it took us a lot of time um, it's the first step because we're looking for the future of digital and so it's the first step to then move to something else whenever that becomes more, uh, more uh, accessible to everyone. Uh, so yeah, thank you for, very much for coming. I hope that also the people that might have had the chance to see it online uh, will record this so that they can see it on our, on our Facebook page. It was live, I don't know how many people might have 
go on live but they might see it later. Um, <coughs> so ESP is in, in real estate magazine and the future of real estate online. If you have any questions, I'm happy to respond and thank you very much. We will go to task to another appointment, but just a couple of quick questions. It, it costs, there's no cost that's free, you mentioned that. VSP, yes. Do you arrange site inspections? Well, I do my work as an agent, yeah. so my, my job as an agent is not for free, <laughs> but we do all that for sure. Yes. What, uh, do you, if I go onto the website, do, is there a list of, I'll call it properties, that are available? The property that are, what we put on there. Of course, we are starting this. Mm -hmm. So we are now uh, we are in the process of onboarding all our existing clients. So obviously, as a real estate agent, we have a lot of listings. So we have people that have already given us the appointment of real estate. Yeah. So those are the people that in our waterfront real estate, you can see the property listed there. Right. So and those property will be available on ESP. Um, as we go. At the moment we have uploaded quite a lot but it takes time yeah. and we wanted to launch this because otherwise it will take us too long. Is it, is it, when you say properties, existing houses but also land for sale? Yeah, yeah, well we have land for sale, we have uh, property, residential, we have commercial for sale, yeah. yeah. And as we increase the listing, obviously the ESP is also to encourage more local people to list their property um, with the ESP and obviously with the waterfront real estate. Yeah, well, I did ask Florida whether it was a conglomerate of all the agents because you know, they could all list their properties and we look at one site and said looking at 10 sites. Well, the, the aim is that eventually, this is, this is quite, a, quite a difficult process as, a, as an innovation. Um, there are other systems that I've seen online, but this has been structured also for the future and the way that things can evolve in different means of doing transactions. Yeah. So, um, at the moment, it's exclusive to us because we need to, we need to test it, we yeah. need to make it work properly and making sure that it works and that people find the advantage useful. And then after that, we might look at expanding and having other real estate agents also. It's, it's a bit tricky the way you can work it out, yeah. but the aim is that, to try mm -hmm. to then make the service available to others. Yeah, thank you. Have you got a card? Yeah, sure, we have all the cards there. Cool. And by the way, if anyone wants to play with the ESP, we've got two computers there and oh, um, really? and we are happy to Sorry. help. So we might terminate our live stream now, if I know how to do it.